first of all uh, we welcome today for today's speaker as well as the panelist uh, uh, advocate isa sarma uh, it's my pleasure to welcome her to for today's webinar and we are known each other for almost uh, five years and uh, she has managed with uh, miss isa for last five years uh, and she is not only a uh, advocate and uh, like uh, IPR uh, uh, post uh, post graduate, but the thing is, a uh, wonderful thing is she knows the science. Basically, she is uh, MTech in biotechnology uh, from uh, Amity University. So wonderful amalgamation of the law, intellectual property, as well as the technology, especially the life sciences, biotechnology, and the recent advances. The best part of this, because you know, most of the time, whenever we are talking in healthcare or the medicine or with practitioners or the scientists, the basic challenge is uh, preserve this uh, intellectual property. Most of the time, even we don't understand the intangible property or the tangi uh, tangible properties. So, like uh, the current healthcare field is undergoing significant changes at the turn of the decade for last one more than one decade now. Many of these are increasing trends, especially for this precision medicine, personalized medicine, genetic engineering, recombinant DNA technology, big data, and the many bioinformatic tools, especially for the new leads, new candidates, uh, healthcare adjacent technology. These all are the key cornerstones of the next decade of the healthcare developments and all are rely heavily on new and novel inventions. So how to, pre how to preserve this? This world is moving with a very fast speed. Anyone can copy your idea, anyone can copy your, uh, because these all are the internet era, we all are posting everything on the social media. How even you can save your photograph even. So given the amount of research directly affecting the healthcare sector, intellectual property law becomes a significant player on the scene. Uh, like it's also crucial for any business model of most of the healthcare related businesses. Here we discuss how healthcare is uh, intertwined with healthcare and how that relationship will evolve in coming years. So this was the basic objective today is to learn from the experience of uh, Ms. Issa um, uh, Sharma, especially on the intellectual property, trademarks, copyrights, this everything. And this is going to talk, make us learn about the types of IP law and what's the significance of the trademarks, uh, trademarks copyright, trade secrets, patents. So these all are. So uh, it all yours, uh, Mr. Issa, today. So you can say, uh, say, you want to go with the presentation first or uh, like one, uh, like a discussion, whatever comfortable to you. If you want to share your presentation, Saloni kindly help. Uh, Mr. First of all, thank you so much, Professor, for allowing me this opportunity. And yes, he, as he rightly said, we know each other for a very long time and I've helped him with certain of the projects. So the idea was that uh, basically to brief you a little bit about what is intellectual property, because even uh, coming forward and explaining that how it is being relevant to the healthcare industry, it's first important to understand that what exactly intellectual property is and how are you going to segregate it. Once you understand the segregation and the types of intellectual property, it will be very easy for you whenever you're coming up with any kind of novel invention or any kind of business idea, where to head to and whom to approach. So yes, Saloni, can you please allow me to uh, share my slides so that we can have one, you can say introductory session and post that I can address to all the specific queries that are. Hi, yes, um, I've allowed you to share your screen. Um, you okay, can share it. sure, just a second. Yeah, is my screen visible? Yes. Perfect. So uh, just a quick uh, introduction about me. So as Professor said that I am actually basically founder of Strembuck and uh, I come from a technical background. So I've done my master's in biotechnology and post that I started working into IP fields. So it's been about 10 years that I'm working into this industry and uh, 
independently you can say five years that uh, we are heading with the Triambak uh, plan as such. And in Triambak, what we do from ideation till the implementation, whatever is being required in terms of intellectual property, I help my existing clients or you can say the innovators to, to actually uh, with the procedure aspect of it so that they don't uh, get lost in the in the you can say timelines and not skipping the relevant part of it so the idea would be that we will be focusing on how to understand intellectual property as you all of know that uh, there are different types of uh, properties as such when you talk about a movable property we all have some of the other kind of movable properties so from your pen to your mobile phone to your laptops everything that can be moved from one place to the another is considered as a movable property that you own immovable properties can be your lands and buildings stuff which is picked to one particular place is considered as an immovable property now, intellectual property you need to understand is different from your tangible properties. It is more of an intangible asset that you create for yourself. And that is the application of your mind. So most of the people confuse intellectual property with, with uh, just the property word. And when we talk about the property word, it is usually considered as either a movable or a movable. So what is intellectual property is basically anything that you create by application of your mind. We will be going ahead with the different forms and how to go about it, what does it include in the later slides. So there are different kinds of intellectual property. First is your pattern applications, then we have industrial designs, trademarks, geographical indications, layout and integrated circuits, trade secrets, protection of new plant varieties and copyright. So these are like broad heads, seven heads of intellectual property, be it any jurisdiction that you're talking about. So if you're concerned about like, for example, US or India, so pretty much the segregation remains same. If I talk about US, we have like three types of pattern applications. In India, we have two types of pattern applications. Designs are considered as separate, uh, you can say entities, whereas in US, it is, it is considered as pattern application, but then the subject matter remains pretty much similar. So ideally speaking, according to healthcare industry, if I talk about holistically related to the medical and healthcare, pattern applications, trademarks, and your trade secrets becomes very important. Copyright to a certain extent, if you are into that uh, kind of version, we will be uh, going ahead with, with, with the categories of copyright application also. But these three things are highly relevant for this, this particular industry. So this is just a, a simple question which says that all I asked was, can I patent my copyrighted trademark? So if you feel that there is no problem with the statement, then of course you need to understand that what exactly intellectual property is and probably we need this session in detail. So this question, so it says that can I patent my copyrighted trademark is basically saying that the subject matter which is under consideration can be patented, it can be copyrighted and it can be trademarked as well. That is not how it occurs. So if you have started like probably a clinic or a pharmacy or it any kind of business into particularly healthcare industry, and you want to protect your brand name, you will not go for filing a patent application because trademark is the right form of intellectual property for you to go ahead with the brand name protection. So that is where this differentiation comes into picture. A non-healthcare uh, example, but then uh, it's easy to relate to. So probably we will go ahead with the healthcare industry, but just to make you familiarize with the different categories. Uh, this example is taken. So all of us have a mobile phone, right? So mobile phone have certain kind of technical and functional features which are embedded into it. So if you're creating anything like data processing, operating systems, anything technical and functional in nature, you need to file for a patent application. So that is technology based. So when I talk about healthcare industry, patent applications can include surgical devices, it can include processes as well. We will be discussing that uh, at the later stage. So then the look and full feel of the mobile itself. So uh, you must have seen in an iPhone or probably a Samsung or a OnePlus, all of them have slightest of the differences in the design that they present. Or to give you a broader example, we all have cars or we all we have uh, watches and watches differ from the design itself. So the aesthetical feel of the product can be filed at the design application. So if you're uh, uh, probably creating a formulation for the first time and, and you produced a drug, so drug 
as an invention will fall under pet patent application. But if you, uh, if you start selling that composition into a very fancy looking bottle, or there is a dispensing mechanism in the bottle, which is not known for the first before uh, you filing the application, then you can consider for filing the design application as well. For the brand itself, so we all use mobile phone from different brands, so Nokia, although it's, it's, it's lost somewhere. So an iPhone or probably a Samsung or probably any other phone. So that brand is the name and the logo that you associate with that for that category you can file for um, trademark application. Yes, sorry to interrupt but voice is very low can you check your earphone okay hello is it uh, better now little better not much but little better okay i will be a little louder then. yeah please sure so as far as your uh, copyrights or applications are concerned anything which is you can say software industry or probably a uh, the code that you have created or the algorithms that you have created inside the mobile phone can be considered for a copyright application. Anything which doesn't fall under these subheads like patent applications, trademark, copyright or design or any other form will can be kept as a trade secret. So trade secret is basically, uh, you can say things which are not time limited. So we will be discussing in the latest stages itself, but trade secrets are not protected by any form of law. Although trademarks, patents, copyright, and design, uh, these are well-recognized acts which are placed across the globe. So these are basically governed by those laws and rules, but trade secrets as such doesn't hold any value. It's just that you need to protect that secret. Once it has gone into the public domain, we cannot do much about it. So we will be discussing trademark applications, patents, and designs in detail. And then uh, a little bit about the trademark valuation and a little bit about the pharma related cases that are currently happening in the COVID world as well. So uh, trademark applications, I think from your head to toe, whatever you use, from your shampoos to your uh, spectacles, to your clothes, to your to mobile phones, to, to your shoes, everything that you wear is belonging to some or the other company or some or the other kind of brand. And why do you go ahead with that particular brand is because you associate with the quality or, or you like that product so much. So that is because of the credibility and the quality that uh, that brand is being maintaining for over the years. So if I like an iPhone or, or probably I'm a Samsung buyer, I would not like to buy somebody else's, uh, some other brand's uh, mobile phone. In that case, what happens is that if you don't protect your brand name as such, it can be diluted by others when you are letting them use it. So trademark applications are not mandatory in nature, but then it is advisable to file. So assumingly, like for example, any of you uh, who's a doctor wants to establish a, a private practice into it. And with the private practice, you want to uh, put a fancy name for your clinic as well. So that uh, clinic name can actually be considered for filing under a trademark application, or you probably uh, come up with any kind of an innovation, which is a device, or probably you have found a method, which is uh, which is novel enough and can be filed as a patent application. In that case, uh, you start naming it as a brand. So brand can be filed as a trademark application, provided that it distinguishes one entity from the other in terms of goods and services. So for example, your, as we were talking about the mobile phones or, or if we talk about the laptops then we have Apple and Dell and other brands, HP. So these are the products which are being associated with that particular brand. But then there are a lot of services as well, like telecommunication services we have. So the networks that we use, some uses Geo, some uses Airtel, some uses Vodafone or any other network that we use. Or it can be airlines. So if you want to fly in one particular airline, that is because you associate with those services. So in all these categories, either product and process, you can consider for filing a trademark application. Now, uh, how to select for a brand? Now, usually what happens is that uh, people try to, to select the brand name, which is describing the line of business that they are into. So if you are willing to open into like, medical services so anything related to med kind of a service or med kind of prefix suffix words are not considered as a very good brand names it might uh, turn to be a good seo practice but as far as trademark act is concerned and that is globally so 
it is not advisable to go ahead with a descriptive framework. So rather than that, choose an arbitrary or a coined word. So that if you have a story behind a brand name, it becomes a little easier for you to get those applications done. Anything which is distinctive and not having descriptive similarity. So if I, for example, uh, Apple is a brand, is a well-known brand name, and I want to, to launch a drug with the same brand name. Now, uh, people might get confused that uh, this thing is either belonging to them or there is any vertical, they are probably getting into pharma industry, something like that. So if there is any deceptive similarity or likelihood of confusion into that particular category, you're not allowed to do that. So again, choosing a na name consciously, which is deceptively similar to any other brand or well-known or general is not as my advice. And these laundry words, which are probably adjectives should not be used in your brand name. So how to go about it? Coin a word. Like for example, I have a story behind choosing Thrambak. So Thrambak is basically Lord Shifts, another name, which is not related to the service that I'm into. So if I choose a name like best legal services, that is not a very good brand name that is being uh, considered. So Thrambak is something which is considered arbitrary for legal services. So that's why it is considered as a good brand name in that particular category. So that's how uh, you should be doing it. Now, as far as trademarks are concerned, these are two categories. One is a word mark and second is your logo. So let me take an example of Starbucks. We all love coffee. So if you go and uh, just look at the word Starbucks, that can be considered as a word mark. So that means that any styling attached to it will not be covered. It is the as it is word, irrespective of styling attached to it. When we talk about the logo, it might include, say, certain figures, color combinations, or font size, the way you write it, all that designing aspect and styling part comes into picture. Ideally, you should be filing both because both have their own equal significance. Logos have high recall value and your word marks have broader form of protection because you might change your logo at the later stages, like probably after five years or 10 years or 15 years down the line, but you would not like to change the brand name. So protecting a word mark along with the logo becomes the best strategy to go ahead with. Now, why to file for a trademark application when it is not mandated by nature? First thing is that it is an ageless asset, which means that once you file for a trademark application for your brand, it is valid for certain time period and it can be extended throughout the life cycle. So say for example, in certain jurisdictions or certain countries, it is given for 10 years. So after every 10 year, you can renew your application for next 10 years and next 10 years and that's how it goes. So even your future generations can actually uh, get benefit of those brand names that are being protected by, uh, by you for that matter. Then it adds to the branding advertising that is given, that is uh, self-explanatory, it builds trust. It also increases the valuation. So whenever a business is concerned or whenever a practice is concerned, if you want to say later on, you want to go for merger acquisitions or if you want to raise funds, in that case, what happens is your valuation depends on a lot of your intangible assets. So what is the due diligence or what is the status of your intangible assets will directly influence your valuation. Currently, it is said that 70% of the valuation of the entire business comes from your intangible assets. And intangible assets is a portfolio of trademark applications, patents, and any other form of IP as well. Then if you don't want to like probably monetize this by yourself, either you can sell it or license it or franchise it. That's how you can monetize intellectual property rights. So that is valid for trademarks as well as patents. And then it gives you exclusive right. So nobody else will be allowed to use that brand name without your permission. If they're doing it, it is considered as direct infringement and you can sue them for that particular category. Now, just to, to let you know what is the brand name worth, basically, although this data is a little old, so just pardon me for that. If I talk about Google, if I talk about Microsoft, if I talk about Vodafone, all these are the figures which are only the worth of the trademark application. We are not even talking about the holistic business line, but just the brand names or the logo contribute to a significant percentage of the valuation of a, of a company. So that is the importance of filing a trademark application whenever you are into any line of business and you're establishing something new of your life. 
Now, uh, these are two categories, you can say, uh, trademark basically follows the Carno classification that is an internationally recognized classification. If you want to identify that which should be the relevant category or the class for you, if in case you want to file for a trademark application, you need to go to Lacarno classification and then read it through. So these are 45 classes which are present. And one to 34 talks about goods. So as we were talking about mobile and uh, as we were talking about laptops, or as we were talking about drugs, or as we talked about surgical instruments, so all these things will be falling under goods because these are products. Then they can be services as well. So if you're providing medical services, that can be considered as a separate class altogether. So you need to file into service class as well. So these are uh, class definitions. I haven't incorporated it, but just to give you a little bit of uh, information, class five is relevant for pharmaceutical related products. Then class 10 is relevant for your surgical related products and then so on. So you can just read it through. So whenever you want to file for a trademark application, we need to conduct the trademark search just to cross check the availability. So that if you start using a brand name for a very long time and you never conducted a trademark search or you never filed for a trademark, at the later stage, there might be a scenario where somebody else comes up and say that this is my brand name and it is already registered under my category. Then your entire effort and resources that you have spent in de developing the business goes underway. So you might be asked to redevelop or to, to rebrand your entire business, which becomes a hassle. So first thing that you should be doing is just conduct a uh, trademark search and it is pretty much free as such. Wherever you want to file, like if you want to file it in US, you can go to US PTO. If you want to file it in Europe, you can go to eSpaceNet. And if you want to file it in India, you can go to IP India. These are, uh, you can say, readily available information on Google. Once you type, type what is the concerned office related to your jurisdiction, you can just conduct a basic trademark search to check the availability of this. Who is that you need to file an application? Of course, the submission of certain forms are required. It will be evaluated. And once we receive certain objections from the examiner, you need to reply to those objections, go for hearing, and uh, then your certificates will be issued. So ideally speaking, uh, like countries take approximately one to two years to grant you certain certificates, and it can be delayed up to a few uh, more years if in case there is a hearing going on. So till that time, you can keep on using your brand name with TM status once you file it. And once a certificate is being granted to you by that particular country, you need to use R. Now, there are uh, these brand, you can say uh, IP rights, your trademark applications are territorial in nature, which means that if you get a trademark registered in India, it will not be valid in US. You have to file a separate application in US as well. So you need to identify what are your potential market areas and accordingly you need to file it all those countries wherever your product is going or wherever your service is being offered. Now these are certain forms, I will just skip those things. These are the offices in India where it can be filed. Currently, everything is digitized, so you just need to log into those websites uh, of uh, government where they are allowing you the patent and trademark offices, and uh, you need to have certain digital signatures, and you can directly file. Now, these applications, for that, you need not to hire an attorney as well. I mean, if you want to go ahead with an attorney, of course, they will have an expertise on, on these kind of procedures. But if you want to do it by yourself also, you can do that. So either the applicant, whosoever created the intellectual property can file, or the attorneys can file. So accordingly, you need to take the call. Now, we'll be considering a bit about patent applications and how to go about it. So patent applications are basically, you can say, innovation that are created by the innovator. And he, sum, he or she submits the application into the patent office saying that this is my creation. So I need an exclusive certificate given to me for this kind of creation. And then there is a condition base that the government will give you a certificate if in case you qualify the patentability criteria, provided that after 20 years, it will go to public domain. And that is, you can say, globally accepted. So beyond 20 years, you cannot extend your patent applications, be it anywhere across the globe. So there can be short-term and long-term patents, so it can be less than 20 years, but it cannot be more than 20 years. So that's how it goes. 
Now, broadly classifying batten applications, uh, it is divided into two categories. One is your product patterns and second is your process patterns. So whatever you can actually create as a product will be filed as a product pattern. So when I talk about product pattern, it can be a drug pattern that needs to be done. It can be a kit or a diagnosis kit or, or any kind of kit that you're talking about. Any kind of instruments that, uh, that are being used in the healthcare industry, in medical industry, that can be considered as a product patterns. Then we have process patterns as well. Now the process patterns uh, uh, have to qualify like uh, under very strict uh, guidelines in different countries. So certain countries allow certain kind of process patterns and certain countries allow certain kind of process patterns. So if I talk about India, India is very, very strict in terms of granting process patterns, but it is very lenient in granting product patterns. When I talk about US, US is comparatively easier in terms of product and process, both the pattern applications. If I talk about Europe, then uh, again, they are very uh, similar to Indian laws. So they are also very strict related to process patterns. So we have to first understand whether it is falling under patentable subject matter or not, because before even wasting your effort to go ahead with it, you need to first understand that according to that particular country, whether you will be allowed to get a patent application or not. So first thing that we have to do is uh, conduct a patent search. So patent search is basically done to cross check whether this thing is already available in the public domain or not. So assumingly that you created a surgical instrument for the first time or catheter for the first time. Now this catheter uh, will be done in a patent search to cross check whether it is made anywhere across the globe or not. If in case it is being done, then of course patent application cannot be filed because it is not mobile anymore. Now, if it is not existing in the public domain before you filing the application, it can be considered for filing the patents. Now, there is a very important point that you need to address is that most of the people uh, who come to us after publishing the entire research and then saying to file for a patent application can actually create a lot of trouble for you. Although the examiner might not find that this is uh, something that you only published at this point of time, but then uh, there are always chances that third party might find it, whosoever doesn't want you to get a patent application. So it is advisable that whenever you are working on anything, no matter how small you think it is, you need to file for a provisional application first, anywhere across the globe, wherever your, your home country is, you can file first application there and then go for publication. So all your international publications and your journals and why not, and even for presentations, disclosing it to multiple people should be done after filing a provisional application. If you don't do that, then your innovation might get lost and you will not be able to file for a patent. Then we need to draft an application. So after the search is being conducted and we feel that it is noble, a patent application will be drafted because whatever you create, it cannot be submitted as prototype. So if you're creating a formulation or a composition for the first time, it cannot be submitted as it is. You need to write the techno-legal document where you're going to describe the holistic technology related to it, along with certain drawings and illustrations, and then only a patent application will be filed. So filing is done, then again, examination will happen, publication will happen. If there are any discrepancies or examiner feeling that it should not be granted, will oppose to those applications, then there will be hearings, and then it is being granted. Now, once a patent application is granted, it is valid for only 20 years, but those 20 years are calculated from your first filing date. So if I'm filing my first application, say on 2020, and my patent is being granted in 2022, it will only be valid till 2040. Right? So this is a, a pattern saying that everybody is claiming that this is what we have created and everybody uh, is having same kind of convention. So who owns it first? It is basically who files it first. It is not the uh, first in to invent system currently, although it was done before. So uh, there were countries which recognized first to invent system. But then it was very difficult to do the due diligence and uh, to find the real inventor who created it first. So it's first to file system. So if you don't file it first, the invention doesn't belong to you. If in case it is bar done by any kind of fraudulent means, then uh, you can challenge those applications. But other than that, it does not. So you need to file the application first. 
then you have certain criteria of patentability which are global in nature so when i talk about uh, criteria there are four of them in which three actually makes a funnel kind of a system you need to first qualify whether your invention whatever you have created either a product or a process that you would like to consider for filing a patent application need to qualify these three so novelty what does novelty mean if i decide to file my first application say today 28th may 2021 now before the state anything which is there in the public domain either patents or non patent literature or prototypes or anything for that matter is considered as a prior art so if that is there whatever i have created is already existing somewhere in that case it will not be patentable so it has to be novel whatever you create has to be naya and novel that is where you are going to file the application then we have inventive step inventive step basically means that the invention is very obvious in nature and it doesn't qualify any kind of inventive step which means that any person skilled in the art like for example dr prabhu is a well known personality into stem cells so if he feels that a patent application which is filed into stem cells research related to it is very obvious you haven't done much about it you just filed by compiling say three four patent applications you read and just uh, combined and filed this application now how to counter that so at the time of examination what we do is that if it would have been so obvious it would have been made by now or the commercial success so there are n number of parameters which can be claimed for countering the objection part of it so it basically says that any person skilled in the art it should not be obvious to that person and skilled in the art can be a, a person who is working into that domain or having that kind of knowledge into that particular kind of domain then we have industrial applicability industrial applicability basically means that it should be capable of being made it should not be something which is arbitrary in nature which is, which cannot be actually formed so say for example like 20 years back i told that i'm going to make a flying car out of it so i just submit an application saying that i want to make a flying car and i submit one drawing that actually doesn't contribute to a patent application unless i explain that what are the components how they are connected and how is it going to actually function as a flying car so abstract ideas or just the ideas cannot be protected by any form of ip you have to express it explicitly and clearly to be able to file an application then we have non patentable subject matter which differs from country to country so if i talk about india and if i talk about us and europe europe and indian are, are basically on the same line with the slightest of the differences but other than that like uh, you can say us and singapore and hong kong these are jurisdictions which are little lenient in granting patent applications so most of the patents that you might find something related to your invention are being filed in us so anything which is uh, frivolous in nature anything which is contrary to public order cannot be filed as a patent application anything which is just a discovery so you haven't invented anything so i think all of you are from medical industry so i need not to explain your difference between discovery and invention but it has to be an invention then may discovery of a new property or a new use so if aspirin is used for treating some particular thing or say for example crocin is being used for your lowering down the temperature now if i say that the crocin can also can cure cancer for that matter so in that case you cannot file for an application because new use is not something where your invention lies so new use might be considered in european jurisdictions but it is not considered in india mere it mixture of two things so if you combine two drugs and say that uh, uh, these drugs have independent properties when i combine uh, their independent properties get combined and that effect is being traced so unless it is producing some kind of synergistic effect like for example if i add a plus b if it is converting to ab it is not something which is a synergistic effect it is a standard reaction now if i'm getting ab square or ab2 or ab into like infinity or what not in that case it is a synergistic effect because it is not a standard reaction that is happening so that's where your intellect comes into picture that you have created something which is having some kind of synergistic effect so if you are producing some kind of admixture of course you can file for a patent application but you have to provide that synergistic effect then may duplication or rearrangement is not allowed what is working already and what is being patented already you are just 
read, uh, arranging it or duplicating it will not be allowed. Now, anything which is related to method of agriculture and horticulture will not be allowed. This is very important, section 3L, that says that any process for medical, surgical, curative, and diagnostic and therapeutic will not be allowed. So India is very strict in terms of process patent applications in terms of healthcare industry. But then on the same side of it, product will be allowed. So if it's a medical related product or a surgical instrument that we were talking about, can be filed as a patent application. But if it's a surgical methodology that you are talking about, it cannot be filed as a patent application. Then we have plants and animals as a whole. Of course, you cannot file for a patent application. But these genetically modified organisms and microorganisms that, that can be considered for filing a patent application. Then we have uh, any kind of business methods or computer per se programs are not filed as a patent application. Currently, healthcare industry is going under a lot of transformation. So we get a lot of clients who are into, if, if I talk about pharma industry, who are incorporating a lot of AI and IT related softwares into the into the entire system. So that's where the innovation lies. So if I talk about just the apps or the softwares that are being functioning as such cannot be filed as a patent application, you need to integrate as a hardware. So if you have a software plus a hardware into healthcare industry, of course, it can be filed as a patent application. Then anything which is literary artistic cannot be filed as a patent application, we can skip this. Anything which is a traditional knowledge. So if there is a traditional way of doing something or there is a traditional product which is already existing in the public domain from years and years cannot be filed as a patent application. Now, uh, filing can be done again by going to the online portal. So you can just uh, either the applicant can file it or if there is a foreign applicant, for example, somebody sitting in US and Europe wants to file an application in India, they can hire a registered patent agent and get the application filed on. Now, there are different types of applications which are very important in terms of uh, going ahead. So as I was explaining you that if you are into research and you publish your research, then you cannot go for filing a patent application. So how to go about it? When you're not ready with your entire innovation, but you still want to file something, then you can go ahead with filing a provisional application. So almost all the countries have this provision of filing a provisional application, which basically means whatever you have as of now, till today, you can submit as, a, as an application, provided that it is movable and uh, the criteria of uh, patentability is met. You can file a first application and claim a priority date. So if I file my first application today, which is 28th May 2021, I will get a priority date of provisional application beyond which anybody else filing across the globe will not get a patent application. Whether I will get it or not is a subject matter of the provision, which, is, which will be followed and eventually I will get to know. But nobody else across the globe will be able to claim that that is, is their invention. So this priority decade date becomes very, very important. You need to file a provisional application, which needs to be followed by a complete. If in case you're ready with everything, so there is no further modifications which are required, there are no further additions which are required in your technology, whatever is the subject matter under question. In that case, what you can do is you can directly file a complete. Otherwise, provisional will be followed by a complete application or you can directly file a complete, which is said to be non-provisional, or there are different terminologies across the globe for, for filing a complete application. So that is something where changes will not be allowed. So once you submit it, that is your invention. No matter what you create out of it, if you're creating a different product, that is not uh, going to qualify for infringement or mapping. Whatever you submit in your patent application is your innovation. So how exhaustively do you write it is going to define the circle of the, you can say, infringement whenever it happens at the later stage. Now, uh, there are different means to enter into international markets. So as we said that these are territorial rights. So how to protect it uh, in multiple countries? First myth that I would like to clear is that there is no world patent as such. So there is nothing as filing one application and getting the protection across the globe. It doesn't work that. So what you have to do is you have to file a first application, base application, anywhere, wherever you are sitting in that particular country. Then you can enter into a PCT route, which is Patent Cooperation Treaty. 
and buy some more time to enter into multiple generations. So PCT basically talks about that it is having list of 160 countries. In those 160 countries, I am announcing that I will be entering all those, into all those countries by submitting a PCT application. PCT gives you an international publication and international, you can say, weightage. So if you are willing to attract any kind of funds or any kind of investors or any kind of merger acquisitions, then PCT application gives you an additional advantage in, in fetching you. So once you file a PCT application, there is additional time period of 18 months. So within 12 months, you have to file a PCT and 18 months are given extra to you to enter into different countries wherever you want to enter. But while entering into those countries, you have to engage a local attorney and then uh, you can say pay the government fees of that particular country. That particular country will follow its entire route of examination, publication, and then patent application is being granted to you in that country. So if I file first base application where zero is written in India, within 12 months, I filed a PCT application in MICO. Then I wanted to enter into US or Canada or China or Japan or wherever you want to enter. So within 30 months duration of time, you can enter into all these countries. So this is giving you enough time to actually work on your commercials and also giving you an international publication, uh, you can say, as well as a search report, which will give you a fair idea whether we should be going ahead or not and what will be the, uh, you can say, objection that will be raised at uh, certain levels and national phases as well. That is how you protect your uh, global applications. So if you want a global patent to be achieved, then you have to file it in almost all the countries possible. Then once you get the patent application, how to go about it? So patent litigation is basically when you have an ownership on IP, when you get a patent application, now it is your responsibility to find who are the infringers who are there in the public domain. So if you find anybody whosoever is using your innovation without your permission, you can actually go into litigation. So litigation is a measure or a remedy that is being given to you for suing those people whosoever are using it without your permission. Then you can claim damages or profits, what, whatsoever you feel is higher. Then we have industrial designs. So as you were talking, the designs only means the aesthetic appeal of the product. So anything which is just the look and feel part of it, if you feel that uh, there is no technology behind it, so say, for example, we uh, have chair, right? So chair, whenever it was made for the first time, might be a patentable subject matter. But the moment uh, it goes and becomes a little generic, now only the shape and the size of the chair is being changed. So in that case, it is not contributing technically or functionally as such. There is no technology involved which can be actually filed as a patent application. So how can we protect it? Probably under design app. So if you have a fancy looking chair, a fancy looking, you can say jewelry or a fancy looking uh, container for that matter can be filed as a design application. So these are certain examples. Again, we are, what we are trying to say is that if it involves the technology part, it will be protected by the copyright. But the outer appearance of all these examples can be covered under design application. These are certain uh, examples related to our healthcare industry. So you have like dispensers, nebulizers, injections, all these things. If it is different in, in terms of look and feel, then you can consider for filing uh, design applications. These are from certain different industries and jewelry and stuff. So design, as we discussed, that uh, is valid for 10 years and post 10 years, it is, can be extended for the next five years. Now coming to trade secrets. So we understood that what is the importance of intellectual property and why should it be registered and how to go about it in particular countries. If you feel that you have something which might be uh, like either falling under non-patentable subject matter or probably it is more than 20 years, you feel that this technology is going to, like for example, as we were talking about the process part of it. So if it's a surgical process, we cannot file for a patent application. Then what we will do is we will keep it as a trade secret. So now how to implement trade secrets when there are no actual laws or acts to govern trade secret, at least in India. So in that case, uh, all your agreements plays a very important role. So whenever, for example, you have a lab set up and, and the entire setup, what all you can do? 
you can place those agreements in a leak proof manner so whosoever works with you either i'm sorry either your employees or it can be vendors so if you're working with some kind of vendors like it can be different some people might be involved into marketing some people might be involved into providing you equipment some people might be involved in other activities so all these are your vendors how to protect your trade secret from all these vendors will be through those agreements and contracts where you are going to write your confidentiality ip clauses in a very very stiff manner so that there is no scope of actually losing out on the trade secrets if there is a, a provision then you also need to apply all those security digital security measures so that's why people don't allow you to carry your mobile phones or pen drives or any electronic devices because they want to maintain certain trade secrets so that's how we go about it whenever we want to go ahead with the trade secret category just to give you one example coca cola formulation is uh, one of the very well known trade secrets which basically i mean no one actually knows what is the coca cola formulation and they never file for a patent application as well so they kept it as trade secret because they felt that it is more than 20 years they can survive in the market although they file for trademark application they file for uh, designs they also file for uh, copyrights as well but they never file for a patent application so yeah uh, again as i've already explained anything which is non patentable can be considered as a trade secret unlimited timeline and then there is no cost involved of course so all your uh, ip rights when you need to protect them are going to incur some or the other cost so there will be professional charges there will be government charges that are applicable so uh, whenever we are talking about the trade secret there is no cost involved so uh, again so confidentiality agreements or digital data security tools you need to implement for protecting it now a little bit about the healthcare industry and how does it go and what are the you can say current scenarios that are placed in the vaccine world so we'll be discussing a bit about compulsory licensing a bit about trademark infringement so what is trademark sorry what is patent application infringement so patent infringement basically means that any use unauthorized use by somebody else without taking the permission of the owner is considered as an infringement so if a pharma company develops the vaccine and the other pharma company uses it and they have a patent application on that without the prior permission it will be considered as a patent infringement now infringement of the patent application uh, basically is being calculated from the claim sections so whenever we write a patent application there are certain divisions to it so whenever you if in case you have ever seen a patent application the last page of the patent actually talks about the claim section and that is where the novelty lies so if you ever want to read a patent application you need to understand that what exactly is it talking about and what is the invention that is under this uh, patent application you need to just read the claim section so you will understand that so whenever an infringement is being happening and then the claim is being mapped with the infringed product so if a pharma company is having a patent application on the vaccine in the claim section there will be elements divided that how exactly is it being protected and what exactly is being written in the patent application if in case it is overlapping with something which is there in the product it is considered as an infringement okay now uh, according to certain uh, you can say uh, provisions it says that there are remedies available related to patent infringement so if in case i hold a patent application and it is being infringed by xyz any entity in that case what rights do i hold so i can go to court and say that i want an injunction injunction basically means that they should stop using this like right now so there can be permanent injunction or there can be temporary injunctions usually whenever a case is being filed and the court is uh, is actually uh, analyzing and feel it that it is fair enough to actually grant a temporary injunction they straight away grant a temporary injunction for immediate release because whenever we are talking about patent application for trademark the damages and the profits are huge so it's 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 a very big figure that we talk about so in that cases it's court's responsibility to actually uh, allot for temporary injunctions permanent injunctions are usually done when the case is being resolved and and the order comes into picture then you can claim for damages or accounts of profit 
it is or it is not like both so if in case i am a small company and there is a big company who is using my say trademark application or bio application what am i going to claim their profit that is being occurred by them because my damages are not so much in comparison to the profit that they are occurring if i am a large company and uh, i am suing a small company in that case i will try to protect the damages that are incurred by me because my damages will be bigger than the profit which is incurred by the small company so whichever is bigger you have to weigh that what what exactly do you want to claim is either the damages or the profits so these are certain remedies then we have certain provisions which are very very important to research and development stage in terms of healthcare industry which says say for example one pharma company is developing one product which is patented now they have an exclusive right for 20 years for 20 years they can only make it and if somebody else wants to make it they have to take a permission there is one now other companies into that particular domain like for example drug development other companies what they can do is they keep on doing the research on that patented product till the patent application goes off patent which means that after the expiry of 20 years research and development is allowed to any company can do internal research and development and modification into the patented drug as well but which means that 20 year time period is lapsed post that you can start launching generic products so that is why the entire you can say pharma industry when i talk about indian market is huge because we are working on generic products so all those which are off patent uh, drugs and formulations are being produced by the companies and these are considered as generic version of it then parallel import is something it says that if i have a patent and i give a license to say properly dr prabhu and now dr prabhu is further licensing to somebody else now in that case what happens is that the further licensee if in case it is non exclusive license or uh, in the, in that particular case the further licensee need not to take an approval from me because i have already given a non exclusive license to to mr prabhu and i have those terms and conditions saying that okay fine you can also further give licenses to other people so in that case i cannot actually uh, they need not to take a permission from me and i will not sue them so these are kind of parallel uh, import provisions which are present in the act itself then uh, we already talked about lateral infringement we will talk a little bit about how doctrine of equivalence so doctrine of equivalence mm -hmm. says that if in case the claim is mapping as it is then it is direct infringement but then when uh, you are using a product which is same just to give you an example like if i have a plastic bottle and this plastic bottle is my patent some and i wrote in my uh, you can say claim section that i am going to go ahead with plastic bottle itself now anybody else making a metal bottle will fall under doctrine of equivalence because there is no technology involved into it what you did was only the material change right so material change will not contribute to a significant difference it is producing same kind of results it is it is being made in a similar manner so in that way it can contribute to doctrine of equivalence which means that you are substituting one element with the other to actually derive the same result so if that is the case it can also be considered as a patent infringement then uh, compulsory licensing is very important related to you can say healthcare industry or pharma industry is because uh, once a patent application is being granted to you you are assumed to actually work on it so if you are not working on it if you are not providing it under affordable prices to most of the people if it is uh, i mean people uh, requirements are not met like what is happening currently in vaccine uh, people requirement is not met so that's why i would see lot of compulsory licensing happening in uh, recent times so compulsory licensing what does it mean it means that for example i have a patent application now government gave me this patent so i should be the only exclusive user of it but if i am not able to produce the same vaccine and not able to uh, do it in affordable prices not able to meet the public requirement in that case the government can actually give a compulsory licensing to somebody else who will manufacture the same 
you can say vaccine and pay me a royalty and that royalty will also be decided by like mutual means with the government patent holder and the licensee as well but here the catch is that the licensee should have tried to reach me first to take the license if i would have refused to give the license then only a compulsory licensing will be required that is what is happening in the current world so there are a lot of pharma companies who are approaching those uh, pharma companies which are producing vaccines and they are under licensing terms so this licensing uh, term needs to be at least like you have to wait for at least 3 years to give a compulsory licensing so if for 3 years you are not able to meet these three requirements in that case it can be given to a uh, smaller companies to actually work on it and give a compulsory so this is current problem where uh, this time period of 3 years is is a challenge and then uh, smaller companies reaching out to bigger companies for vaccine uh, licenses is the challenge so once they refuse a challenge then they might go for government uh, compulsory licensing and they, i i mean if in case it happens so it will be for the first time that this time period of 3 years would be waived off and so i'm also looking forward for it this is one case law which is very famous in healthcare industry which was bear versus natco a uh, bear actually bear uh, produced uh, you can see say cancer drug anti cancer drug and they were selling those uh, cancer drugs for a very exorbitant price which was 2 lakh something 2 lakh 80000 or so and uh, natco said that this anti uh, cancer drug is actually not even meeting 2% of the cancer's population and it is being sold at a such a like heavy price that is being quoted so it is not affordable by general people and we have reached out there uh, to give us licenses they have refused to give licenses so now we are reaching out to government saying that we would like to take a compulsory licensing on that so after the entire case was resolved it was actually in favor of natco So, Uh, please unmute yourself and you need to share your screen again. Oh, yes, just a second. Yeah. Right. Am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible now. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, we were discussing about the compulsory licensing. There is one more case where uh, the company approached the government saying that we want a compulsory licensing to be granted to us with the, again a cancer drug. But then the government said that you never made an attempt to procure a license from the patent holder. So unless you do that, and there is no public advantage that is being provided into this request of compulsory licensing, so we will not be granting you any kind of compulsory licensing, and it was refused. So the first prerequisite is that whosoever is the patent holder, you first need to go to them because to recognize the monopoly right of a patent application, that's where, that's why people spend so much on the research and development and filing applications and whatnot to procure the exclusivity over it. So the government said that, what the controller said that uh, uh, basically you need to go out to the, light, to the patent holder first and then only prob probably you can actually reach out to us. So it was refused. Now, currently, Pfizer and Indian government are actually under a uh, little bit of uh, hassle related to indemnity against the cost of compensation for the side effects. So, Indian government is currently, I, I in fact read the news today itself that Indian government is actually considering to indemnify Pfizer so that they uh, produce vaccines and gives to Indian jurisdictions as well. Although uh, other countries like Britain and United States agreed to the indemnity clause, so that's where they started making it. 
Now, India also uh, approached WIPO, which is like basically an international, you can say, organization for a waiver of intellectual property rights. So, which is uh, a very interesting thing to look forward to because that has never been done. So, if in case uh, that happens, because some of the countries are in favor, some of the countries are against it, it is going to change the IP laws. So, uh, let's look forward for that, how, how it goes. And in India also, Supreme Court recently said that probably you should be uh, revoking compulsory licensing. And again, as I said, as this three-year time period uh, will be very interesting to see whether it will be diluted to certain less number of years and, and the vaccine uh, production will be given to other people as well, other food companies as well. So I think uh, let's, let's wait and see how it goes. Now, IP valuation, just a quick uh, Part of it uh, I would like to explain is basically analyzing that what is the worth of your intellectual property. So when I talk about trademark applications or patents or copyrighted design, what exactly does it worth? So IP valuation um, is actually done by a registered valuer as well as an uh, IP expert where they analyze a lot of things like uh, a standard valuation includes different type of methods and uh, IP experts analyze that, say, for example, if you have filed a patent application, what is the current status of your patent application? How effectively have you written a patent application? What are the chances of your claims getting approved? And what are the jurisdictions where all you have filed? So if you have filed it in multiple countries, of course, your valuation gets shoot down. So all these things, Things define a lot of your intangible valuation and it should be considered while uh, going ahead and maintaining an IP portfolio, no matter where you are sitting. So all these things are global in nature and I, I feel that you should be considering it whenever you want to uh, get into any kind of business related to uh, healthcare industry. Now, one more point is that whenever you're working with an organization, like this is uh, one very important point that has been raised most of the time is that if I'm working with an organization and I'm creating on something, who is the owner of that intellectual property? In that case, you need to go back and look at your employer agreement because ideally, whosoever creates it is the intellectual property owner. So you're going to create and file the application. But if your contract says that whatever you create will be dependent on the premises and because that organization is providing you those kind of facilities, that organization is providing you those kind of infrastructure and research uh, equipments and whatnot. So in that case, uh, if the clause says that the intellectual property will remain with the organization, then you cannot do much about it. You, you will be considered as an inventor, but the applicant will still be that organization. So whenever you create something, you need to go back and cross-check that portion of it. And then only you can consider that who is going to file for an application. There are certain organizations which compensate the innovators. So if the clause says that you will be paid certain percentage of royalty or you will be compensated in a number of manners or, or in any other way, that can also be done. So it, it basically depends how well is, is it drafted and whether IP and confidentiality clauses are mentioned. Now, uh, I think this is uh, it from my end. If in case you have any questions, specific questions, I can address to that. Uh, thank you, Esther, for this wonderful insight on uh, IPR. Uh, please stop sharing your screen. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me check if uh, we have uh, any questions from the audience, and uh, then uh, probably a few questions uh, it's, uh, arises uh, uh, with me. So I'll ask my two questions to you. Uh, one question is from Dipti Srivastava here. Any specific methodology formulated by someone will be uh, patented or be applied for copyright? Specific methodology formulated by someone will be patented. Specific methodology related to what? First of all, that is the question. So 
it's not like uh, patent applications cannot be filed for methods, although the act says that per se method methods will not be filed, but if in case you can integrate it with a product, then the process also becomes an integral part of it. So that is the, you can say, the strategies which are used by the drafters and how well the patent application is written is going to cover it. So if it is falling under the patentable subject matter, a patent can be filed because it's not a very specific question. Either if you can just explain me what is the concern. But if you're talking about like algorithms or the write-ups or the catalogs that you use or the methodologies that you use, or if you want to write a book for it, in that case, you can consider for filing a copyright application rather than a patent. And uh, we can also add, like uh, copyright uh, doesn't require an innovation. It should be like a unique with word, like without plagiarism, without plaque. But the thing is- uh, It has to be original. It has to be original. Yes, as you rightly said, that innovation is not required. But then uh, if you're writing a book, so that includes the methodology part of it, that will be protected into it. But then it is very, you can say, stiff in matter. So whenever there is a uh, there is a slightest of the difference that becomes a different subject matter altogether. So it becomes very, very difficult for you to prove that the substantial portion is being copied. And that's where the patent application gives you a very broad form of protection. So if it is process plus product, you can still consider for filing a patent application. If it is only process and the methodology, probably write a, write a you can say a compiled version of it. Okay, I have, what is, what are the expenses for the entire process of patent application? That depends from countries to country. So if I, if I talk about India, it will be roughly about one to two uh, lakhs or so. And uh, if I talk about uh, other countries like US, it can go up to five to six lakhs or so, and so on. So it depends upon the, the countries that you're filing. It also depends on, on the applicant who is filing. So if you're an individual inventor or if you're a small company, there are huge fee reductions which are applicable in government fees. So you can actually enroll them and lower down the cost. So five to six lakhs means 500,000 Indian rupees to 600,000 Indian rupees. You can convert in USD. Uh, so a method of treatment of any specific conditions. Uh, oh, Dipti have elaborated the question. A uh, method of uh, treatment of any specific condition. I think we're probably see the actual should... procedure process. So this process cannot be filed as a patent application if you're talking about individual protection because India is very strict in terms of process related patents. It needs to be incorporated with a product then only you can file, otherwise file for a copy. This process will not fall under patent subject matter. That means, uh, let's say, if um, uh, can it be with the combination with the uh, procedure as well as uh, the uh, like design of the protocol, something like that, methodological design as in the procedure, it can be filed together as a patent or not? It, it has to be a product because the product and process integration needs to be there for an Indian jurisdiction uh, to be uh, able to file. I am asking, like, if it is the methodology no and uh, i'll ask one thing like for especially in the field of like uh, we are working regenerative medicine and the translational medicine uh, let's say because uh, patent is generally for the hypothesis and the concept i'm just giving you a broad example but if uh, they are restricting for the patent product only so for product we need the primary approval from the concerned authority like the drug control general of india or the Indian Council of Medical, whatsoever things is required, like Constitutional Ethics Committee for product approval, we should go for the CTRI, for clinical trial research institute, of, because it's innovative, it's a new thing. And then we'll go with the Drug Control General of India. Then primarily we'll go for the product formation. So mm -hmm. if then uh, if we are filing uh, the, like let's say we have drawn the product mapping, everything like uh, this equipment is required, this, uh, this is the centrifuge, this is their RPM, blah, blah, blah and uh, this thing and then primarily we require the approval first from the drug controller or respect, respective regulatory authority or should i directly go for the patent for uh, filing the first thing that you have to do is file a patent application it doesn't matter how well drafted or you can say well analyzed your application is currently filing a provisional application will secure the ideation that you're talking about then you have to go to all these agencies for acquiring the different certificates and then only 
uh, the publication can happen. If you keep on going to all these people for all those kind of licenses, it is, it is actually said that the technology is lost. Then you can not go ahead for filing a patent application. That is why I said, file a provisional application. You get 12 months time period, one year time period to work on it. Meanwhile, you do whatever you want with, with all those licenses and the business part of it. So IP is not concerned about your business part. If, if you're getting a license or not, it is not, you can say directly related to the IP strategy or the process that they follow. What they need is file first patent application, get the priority date and post that you do whatever you want to do for 12 months. And once you're ready with the complete application, file the complete application with all the futuristic versions of it. Right? Because unless uh, you, so you have to think in a term like it is going to be valid for 20 years time period. So there will be modifications coming into it. So even if you don't have it right now, if you can think that way, at least try to write claim in such a broad manner that it will cover that part as well. Amazing. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Sir. I'll ask when uh, uh, it may be a very uh, like this is just a brainstorming questions. What uh, we got, um, like uh, say uh, these days, uh, social media is the biggest marketing platform, and you know, and uh, ads, uh, this uh, IPR, especially trademarks, etc. Is the as you said, it's a territorial, it's a geographically restricted. If I have some mm -hmm. certain trademarks for India. I cannot use in the US or other country or other geographical uh, territories. Mm -hmm. And uh, but these um, uh, social media is nowadays is the boundaryless. There is mm -hmm. nothing about a boundary. Something I have the trademark, and someone is using that trademark from other country, the same name on the social media. Can I sue them or not? Do I have rights? Right. So when I started the session, uh, I actually said that trademark applications are not mandatory in nature. So if you are using something which is globally accepted, right? So because your social media is something where you will have traction from across the globe. Your websites or apps are something which is not country specific as such. All the laws are country specific, so it does apply to it. So if you're talking about something like where trademark applications are not registered, you can still have a provision of passing of cases, which means that you have a trademark application, you your brand name into US as well, but you haven't filed a US application. You can still sue those person if you have a clientele in US. First, first requirement is that. If you're selling a product, your product should be commercially sold in that particular jurisdiction. If you're providing services, your clientele needs to be in that particular jurisdiction. So if you have a client in US, you can still file a passing off case against them, even if you don't have a trademark application. If you have a trademark application, nothing like it, that proves to be a, you can say, a very good evidence against the entrenchment category. So that that case will be expedited and, and uh, move uh, pretty fast into it, but you still have certain rights into it. So both your trademark and copyright applications can be used in terms of user data, but this doesn't happen in patent applications. Patent cannot be claimed. Of course. So if you don't have any right into the US country, no, I'm asking for you the cannot go ahead. Yes, uh, trademark you can do. You can file a passing off case, even if you don't have a trademark registered. Because, you can even, even in the class 41? Or it's yes, irrespective yes. of the class? If you have no, no, it is class specific. So it has to be in that particular class only. So if you're providing services, like for example, you are into medical services and you have clients sitting in US also, who, who, to whom you're providing these medical services. So it automatically gives you a passing off case uh, kind of a scenario where you can go ahead with it, irrespective of whether you have filed for a trademark application or not. Ideally, you would have filed a trademark application you have a better chance of winning the case but in general also you have a case okay. uh, yeah. oh, then two question is there here from the mark Mueller. uh for a usa patent application do i need a u.s lawyer and do i need to be u.s resident right both can file so if you are say for example you are the inventor who wants to file for an application you can also say uh the searching and drafting is pretty much global. So anywhere across the globe, whosoever is a registered patent agent can do it. So you by yourself can also file an application. You just need to go to USPTO. There will be certain forms which needs to be required to fill. So you as an inventor, as a US resident can file for an application. If you don't want to do that, then of course a local agent, which is going to be a US registered patent agent is going to file the application. 
and uh, uh, Mr. One, one more questions because these things coming to us day by day because nowadays this era is very competitive and we are all digital services based. Like uh, mm -hmm. you know, we are buying the photographs, let's say from the IS stock or such a stock. Many vendors, any get mm -hmm. emails, blah blah blah, uh, and number of service provider. If we are getting uh, the images, we have taken the monthly plan. Certain new image. I have used for my website or for my social media promotion. If the same image by used by uh, other people, let's say you have used, let's say either like uh, you you got that image from the gate email or you got the image from our website, I don't know, but the same image I have purchased, I have the purchase license from the gate or any no. provider. So like what kind of action taken or initiated in that case? They have the legal right to use that or they can uh, like uh, get the separate license from the vendor i have taken no so usually such websites where uh, copyrighted images are being sold that is their responsibility to cross check that who is the owner of copyright for that particular brand name because it is being sold to you and you have paid the compensatory uh, thing into it you will not be like but if in case you are just randomly downloading an image and losing it in your commercials and that turns out to be somebody else's copyright application and they can prove that they did it first in that case you will be held liable. but if you're just buying from those portals where it is being uh, considered as a copyrighted subject matter it is their responsibility to fetch that it's not your responsibility yeah. The, nowadays, uh, but if they sell uh, the image uh, at the same time to two different people, uh, and both uh, is, both of them can use it, they generally don't do it. The provision should not be like that. And um, uh, licenses. See, there are two things. One is if they're selling the entire picture to you, then you are going to be the exclusive uh, person who is buying it. If they're just giving you a license to use, in that case, it can be exclusive or non-exclusive. So exclusive means non-exclusive means do logo contract. In that case also, you will not be the person who will be sold. So when they, uh, they sell it as exclusive, uh, they charge heavily, like twenty-five thousand per image. Like uh, once I uh, I tried to get it, while uh, non-exclusive images we get uh, for thousand rupees. Many images we can get, so we generally go for the non-exclusive uh, images uh, for time being. But at least to secure that whatever image we have, that no one can say that uh, you know we have uh, uh, misusing it. Or yes, not yes, using nobody can say that. No, no, non-exclusive does. Yeah. So it, only for that purpose, uh, uh, we have purchased. But for exclusive, they charge very heavily. I understand. So whenever you buy those uh, images, like whenever you go to a portal, there are certain terms and conditions that you agree to. I, I assume that you haven't read them. So you have to actually go through the terms and conditions. So when it says non-exclusive license, you are also agreeing that, okay, fine, I'm taking the non-exclusive license. The other person to whom it is being given is also agreeing that it is a non-exclusive license. So now these two people cannot actually fight with each other that we are given an exclusive license. Right? So the liability is will not come on you because you have paid for it and you have taken a non-exclusive license, which means that you are also allowed to use and he is also allowed to use. When it is an exclusive license, only you are allowed to use. And if somebody else is using, then of course you can sue them. Okay. And the, nowadays, the many terminology, sometimes we don't understand. People use the terminology like uh, transparency principle or the public interest principle, uh, or uh, there was some more, I forget, like priority principle or something like that in trademark. So what exactly the, the, mm. this? is this a, like uh, when we file or when we get the certificate or what, what like likely to see usually it is basically the right uh, is given to the person who is having a patent uh, sorry a trademark certificate into that category but then uh, the user date your your user date defines the entire picture to it. So if even if you are granted a trademark application, a certificate, somebody else comes up and says that I've been using it from last 25 years and you have been granted from last two years, but I never bothered to file an application. So whosoever files it first, sorry, whosoever is having a user date first will be the one who is going to win the case. If he 
sues the other person who is having a certificate also in that case also user uh, date will claim into picture and that is why it is said that whatever documentation whatever you create either trademark applications or copyrights or patent for patent i will not say because it's first to file system but for trademarks and copyright it is highly important that you maintain the database where you are documenting whatever you are creating so if you're creating something like an image for the first time or painting for the first time or brand for the first time at least document the age either like email it to you or get it notarized by some means so that whenever a fight comes into picture even if you don't have a trademark certificate or if you have a trademark certification whenever a fight comes into picture your user date will be deciding the entire fight Thank you, thank you for this wonderful session, uh, Mrs. Sam. Hand rubbing this session to Dr. Nidhi Purana. Thank you so much, uh, Advocate Isha, uh, for putting up this very comprehensive information for all uh, the people who've joined us today. And uh, since it's a topic where uh, we should be like aware of, but then it is highly neglected among the community. And it was really nice to have you on board today to have shared such uh, um, your experience and knowledge with all of us. And on behalf of the entire team, as a token of appreciation, may I present you the, the certificate of appreciation uh, for sharing your valuable knowledge as a guest speaker on HealthTape platform. And we will look forward to keep listening to you in further episodes or in any other form in future. And thank you so much for being here today with us. Thank you so much for being a patient listener to me. Thank you so much for inviting us. Absolutely, absolutely. Take care, stay safe. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody who's been able to join us today for this health tape session. Please uh, follow us on our social media platform so that you stay updated with our upcoming sessions um, on health tape. And with this, uh, the next health tape session is on 12th June. Uh, no, 2nd so of June, 2nd of June first. 2nd of June first, yes. And so uh, we will all um, again meet on 2nd of June at the same time. So till then, bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much.